I invite you to take your Bibles this morning and turn with me to the Gospel of Luke. We have been ending our summer with a, a short series on prayer, and this morning I want us to begin thinking about the prayers of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke, because Luke makes a special emphasis on prayer. And we see this not only because he, he mentions prayer more than any other gospel, but he specifically mentions Jesus praying in several places where the other gospels don't mention Jesus praying. Luke is concerned to point out that especially powerful moments of Jesus' ministry happened in the context of prayer, that prayer paved the way, the way for God to work and for Jesus' ministry to be carried forward. So in chapter 3, verse 21, if you'll, if you'll turn there, in chapter 3, verse 21, Luke tells us, now when all the people were baptized and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in a bodily form like a dove and a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. And, and Luke wants to point out what maybe the other gospel writers assumed but didn't mention in their gospels, that Jesus was praying at his baptism and it was through prayer that the heavens were opened and the Spirit came upon him and the Father recognizes him publicly as his beloved Son and strengthens him with love. And so you could say the beginning of Jesus' ministry and his anointing with the Spirit for ministry began with personal prayer. In chapter 5, verse 16, if you look down a few pages ahead, as Jesus' ministry begins to grow and become successful with the crowds, and crowds began to gather, begin to gather and to hear him, Luke wants to point out, verse 16 of chapter 5, Jesus would withdraw to desolate places and pray. Uh, the verb there is actually in the, in the present tense, meaning this was a continual practice of his. Jesus would be withdrawing to desolate places to pray, to get away from the crowds, to seek out time for prayer. Down in chapter 6, verse 12, if you look down further, you'll notice Luke says, In these days, Jesus went out to the mountain to pray. And all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them 12 whom he named apostles. Luke is the only one of the gospels that tells us that Jesus' appointing of the 12 apostles was pre proceeded, preceded by an entire night alone in prayer. In other words, great decisions that Jesus had to make that impacted the whole of history and the foundation of the church were made while praying. And you, you can imagine Jesus the night before praying. We, we know he wasn't looking for the typical things people looked at in choosing the 12 apostles. They weren't the typical people anybody else would have chosen. He wasn't looking for people with the right education and pedigree. He was starting something new and beginning with raw materials, very raw materials. And so you understand why he spent the entire night praying. Look, look down at chapter 9, verse 18. It says, Now it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him. And he asked them, Who do the crowd say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, but others say Elijah, and others that one of the prophets of old is risen. Then he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, 
the Christ of God. It's Luke alone who tells us that this decisive moment when Peter and the disciples finally confess with conviction that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, that this happened in the context of prayer. It was pre preceded by Jesus praying. Jesus' prayers set the stage for his question to the disciples and their confession of him as the Christ. Look down a little further, chapter 9, verse 28. It says, now about eight days after these things, he took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. Luke alone specifically tells us, gives us the purpose of Jesus and James and John and Peter going up on the mountain. It was to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzlingly white. Luke wants you to know that the transfiguration, the, the vision of Moses and Elijah and the coming of the cloud and the voice from heaven, all of these, these things that happened in this famous moment happened as a result of prayer. The, the greatest unveiling of Jesus' heavenly glory during his earthly ministry happened because of prayer. David Helm says, prayer is the instrument God uses to ready us for his revelation. As a consequence of prayer, people will come to recognize Jesus for who he is. They will learn what it is like to be his disciple and they will be equipped to serve him well. While God saves people through his word and while he strengthens his people in faith through that same word, he nevertheless reveals himself as a result of prayer. One could almost argue that in Luke's gospel, whenever the gospel is seen to be taking root and growing, it does so in the soil of previous prayer. Paul Miller says, Luke especially emphasizes that Jesus' prayers create breakthroughs. Insight emerges out of Jesus' prayer life. Power and wisdom flow effortless, effortlessly from Jesus' praying. Phil Riken says, it seems that whenever anything of major importance happened in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, it was surrounded by prayer. Now, why is that? Why did Jesus pray? That's a, that's a common question. Sometimes people can, if you're a young Christian, you can kind of wrestle with, why, why in the world would Jesus pray? It's an important question. Because it's, it's easy to think that Jesus praying, isn't that superfluous? He's God. It's kind of redundant. But that obviously is wrong. And it, and it wasn't just that Jesus was setting a good example with some token prayers for our sake. Luke tells us he would often go by himself to desolate places to pray alone. And it wasn't like he was out there saying, I, I wonder if this is long, a long enough example. I can go back now. Jesus was truly God, but he was also truly man. And in his life and in his humiliation as a man on the earth, he lived as a perfect man. Well, what does the perfect man need? The perfect man needs complete dependence on God, seeks constant communion with God and guidance and wisdom from God. We, we want to be with God. We, we want God to be directing us what to do. Psalm 71, verse 5 says, For you, O Lord, are my hope, my trust, O Lord, from my youth. Upon you I have leaned from before my birth. You are he who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually of you. And those are the words of Jesus. Jesus. 
In Isaiah 50, verse 4, the voice of Jesus is the servant of the Lord. In the prophecy of Isaiah says, The Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are taught that I might know how to sustain with a word him who is weary. Morning by morning he awakens, he awakens my ear to hear as those who are taught. That's the testimony of Jesus. His eyes open in the morning and his prayer is to hear from his father. In the gospel of John, Jesus says, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. The father loves the son and shows him all that he himself is doing. I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. And, and those words from John's gospel, you could say, are Jesus' own testimony to his prayer life. That his Father was with him. That he, he only wanted to do what he heard from the Father. Jesus doesn't do anything without abiding in his Father. And, and that is an example he gives us, isn't it? He, he tells us, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And so we need to be abiding the way Jesus was abiding. Now, I want us to look at one more example from Luke's gospel, and it's going to really be the, 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 the rest of our focus this morning. Look, look down at chapter 11, Luke 11. And in Luke 11, we have Luke's version of the Lord's Prayer. And, and you'll notice, we're going to read through this in a second, you'll notice this is given in a different context than in Matthew's version of the Lord's Prayer, which, which Jesus gave earlier in his ministry and was part of the Sermon on the Mount. Um, and so we, we see that Luke gives this here in a different place, and, and so we know that Jesus gave a number of his teachings probably on different occasions. And, and not every disciple heard him at all the same times. And there's a disciple here who asks him to teach him to pray. And Jesus teaches, again, the Lord's Prayer. Um, it, it's interesting to me that Luke gives this story right after the story of Mary and Martha, where Martha was troubling herself with all, all kinds of things while Jesus was teaching. And Jesus had to say to her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Um, you know, it's, uh, Tom mentioned er earlier, uh, when we have a fellowship meal afterwards, uh, there's no reason to be in the kitchen preparing food while God is giving us his word. This is what we need most. And so right after that story, we're, we're told this. Chapter 11, verse 1. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. And since that's going to be our, our focus, let's actually pause now and, and pray in response to God's word. Our Father, we thank you for the example of Jesus praying. We thank you that our Savior Jesus prayed. We thank you that he lived as a perfect man in dependence on you. We thank you that that communion with you sustained him
in his life in this fallen world. And that you answered his prayers again and again by, by working powerfully through him to spread your word and your gospel, to grant the Holy Spirit, to fill him with your love, to give him power in ministry. And we pray this morning that you would, as we consider your example, that you would teach us to pray. We pray and ask in your name. Amen. So you, you see here that Jesus teaches the Lord's Prayer in the context of Jesus himself praying. You could say Jesus' prayers that we, we've now looked at throughout, throughout Luke's gospel made an impact on his disciples. Um, and you might even say Jesus praying led to his disciples wanting to pray. Or it's probably not going too far to say that Jesus was likely praying for his disciples to want to pray. When they finally ask him, Lord, teach us to pray. Matthew Henry says, Lord, teach us to pray is itself a good prayer. Now, most of you immediately notice that there's some differences in the Lord's prayer here that we are from that we are more familiar with in Matthew's gospel. This one is shorter. It has some words missing. And, and it's a reminder that the, the Lord's Prayer was, was not primarily meant to be a mantra. It was meant to be a model. It wasn't just a pattern of words that you need to repeat brainlessly over and over again. I mean, it's okay to, to pray the specific words of the Lord's Prayer, but it's really a pattern of elements to focus on in prayer. And so even though there are some words missing here, you, you do see all of the same elements for focus here as you do in, in Matthew's version. And so even though there's some, there's some words missing, Jesus is saying here, these are the things you should be praying about. And it's, it's not a complicated formula. It's beautifully simple. And the beauty begins with the very first word. Jesus teaches his disciples to pray, Father. There, there is something different between praying, Dear God, and praying, Dear Father. Sometimes you can even tell a difference in people's prayers when they go from praying, dear God, to praying, dear Father. We, we may be today so familiar with the Lord's Prayer that we don't understand how radical this actually was. Praying to God as Father was not the normal Jewish way to address God in prayer prior to this. God, God is certainly recognized in the Old Testament as a father, but, but even outside the Bible, scholars have found a, a difference beginning really with the New Testament in people praying to God as father. We, we know that the Bible teaches that Jesus is the eternal son of God, the only begotten son of God, and so Jesus naturally prays to God with an intimacy that is unusual. He, he regularly in, in the Gospels, particularly in the Gospel of John, talks about my father in a way that was shockingly unusual in his day, with a level of personal relationship that was not seen before. And yet, how fascinating that is in the Lord's Prayer, he teaches you to pray with the same intimacy with which he prayed. John Calvin writes, who would break forth into such rashness as to claim for himself the honor of a son of God unless he had been adopted as a child of grace in Christ by the sweetness of this name, Father. He frees us from all distrust. And, and you see, you can see the importance uh, of how the, new, how the early church and the early Christians thought of this in how the Apostle Paul writes 
in both Romans 8 and Galatians 4 that, that God has given us the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry what? Abba, Father. Galatians 4, 6 says, because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts crying, Abba, Father. Now, that word Abba was the Aramaic word for father that would have been used in first century Jerusalem for people speaking in the family of their father. What, why does Paul throw an Aramaic word into the letters that he's writing to people in Greek-speaking areas? And, and the answer has to be because it's the word that Jesus himself would have used in prayer to his father that he teaches his disciples to pray for themselves as adopted sons with the spirit of Christ in our hearts. One, one writer says, prayer is the expression of a relationship. And so it is a relationship that Jesus grants. Because no one knows who the Father is except the Son and the one whom the Son chooses to reveal him. So this prayer is really not for the, for the public. It's not for everybody. It's for disciples. Those whom Jesus has made the Father known. To whom Jesus has made the Father known are granted the privilege of calling on God as Father and that raises the question, do you know God as Father through Jesus Christ? Do, do you call upon him as Father, as, as Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 17? Is that real in your life and your experience because of your faith in Jesus Christ that has given you an alien and a foreigner adoption into the family of God so that you can call God intimately, boldly, personally, Father. William Barclay tells the story of a, of a Roman emperor coming back to Rome in triumph. He was marching his troops through the streets along with a number of prisoners, the streets were lined with cheering people and legionnaires stationed at the street's edge to keep people in place. And at one spot along the route was a, was a platform where the empress and her family were sitting to watch the emperor go by. And on that platform with his mother was a young child, the emperor's youngest son. And as the emperor's chariot came near, the, the little fellow jumped off the platform, wriggled through the crowd, and tried to dart between the legs of a legionnaire and, and run out to greet his father's chariot. And the soldier stooped down and scooped him up and says, you can't do that, boy. He says, don't you know who is in that chariot? That's the emperor. You can't run out to his chariot. And the lad laughed in his face. He may be your emperor, but he's my father. And that is the marvel that Jesus says we should begin with prayer. He's the king of the universe. But if you know him, he's your father. Now we've only gotten through one word. So we need to move a little faster. And so you'll notice that Jesus begins his model for prayer here with, with two petitions directed towards God. He, he doesn't teach us to begin with your own personal needs and desires, but to begin with the honor and purpose and kingdom of God. Your first need in prayer is a sense of communion with God himself for you to be raised higher than your earthly perspectives and needs and to be subdued in your life by his greater purposes. Do you see that? And so he begins, Father, hallowed be your name. And he's not just declaring that God's name is, is holy. He's praying. He's praying. 
that God's name would be hallowed. In the Bible, God's name is all of who he is. His, his name is the revelation of his character that is worthy of honor and praise. And so the first petition of the Lord's Prayer is that the worthiness of God's name would be recognized and honored in your life and in the lives of everyone around you that he would be given the honor that he is due. In Ezekiel 36, 23, God says, I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations and which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. And so God in the Bible rebukes the people of Israel for not hallowing his name. And he promises that he will hallow his name. And so here Jesus tells us we should pray that God would do what he's promised and that his sanctification program, his hallowing program would come to pass in your life, in your family, in your church, in your community, in your world. You, you think about the third commandment. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And, and that commandment was not just about a form of words or people swearing. It was about the reality of all of God is being honored and manifest in your life. One writer says to hallow God's name is not merely to live righteous lives, but to have a heart of grateful joy toward God and, and a wondrous sense of his beauty. That, that his name would be not just honored out of fear, but honored out of joy and beauty in our lives. And then after praying that God's name would be hallowed, praying for God's reputation, we then pray for his rule. Jesus says we should pray, your kingdom come. And it's certainly part of his rule being manifest that his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Those, those words Jesus doesn't include here, but it's per, certainly part of praying for his kingdom to come, that his will would be done. We, we want to see all things done according to his counsel and direction, that the things that are wrong in our lives and wrong in the lives of everyone around us would be set right. That the rebellion that is happening in the world around us, even in our hearts and the hearts of everyone around us, would be set right. That justice would be restored. We, we know that God's kingdom has already come in Jesus Christ. He has ascended to the right hand of the Father. He's been given the name that is above every name. But we still are praying for the full consummation of that, for that reality that is in heaven to be fully brought on the earth, and we want to see it come quickly. And so we are to pray for change. And it's our cynicism that we don't pray for this. It's our cynicism that we just get depressed by the news rather than motivated to pray with confidence. We don't pray for change in ourselves. We don't pray for change in others. We don't pray for change in the world like we should. And Jesus says, that's the first thing you should pray. In the Sermon on the Mount, he said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all the rest will be added to you. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. John Stott says we are constantly under pressure to conform to the self-centeredness of our culture. We become, become concerned about 
our little name, about our silly little will. But in the Christian counterculture, our top priority concern is not our name, our kingdom, our will, but God's. And so in our, in our prayers, we, we need to begin with adoration. Um, one, one person says, adoration comes before asking. And by asking, he means all of our, our littler concerns. Part of the purpose of prayer is to get us out of our limited perspective and to get us into God's story and perspective before we get into all of our concerns to raise our eyes higher to enter his throne room to have communion with him and to see his purposes. Tim Keller tells the story of a woman who, who after hearing this explanation of the Lord's Prayer said, but before I would run right to my prayer list. And the more I went through all the problems and needs I had, the more anxious and burdened I would get. Now I've started spending time thinking about how good and wise God is and how many prayers have he answered, he's answered of mine in, in, my, in my past. And when I finally get to my own needs, now I find I can put them in his hands and feel the burden coming off me rather than on me because I see that he is a king. Thou art coming to a king, large petitions with thee bring. For his grace and power are such, none can ever ask too much. Amen? Amen. Now only after that does Jesus get to what we should pray for ourselves. And after directing our hearts Godward, Jesus gives Three petitions to pray for ourselves, to pray for provision, pray for pardon, and pray for protection. Easy to remember, three Ps. Provision, pardon, protection. There Ralph Davis says, we pray for provision because we are dependent. We pray for pardon because we are guilty. And we pray for protection because we are fragile. And I think those are pretty self-explanatory, but let's, let's just think through them quickly. First, we pray for your, our daily bread. And the word there, verse 3, is, is a, a present tense verb, meaning it's an ongoing thing. Be giving us daily our bread for the day. And you can't help but think of the picture of Israel in the Old Testament in the wilderness wandering in the desert, where they were dependent on God for manna each day. You remember that, that great story and, and word picture where the people were given only enough for each day. And so this is, is a picture of how we should be every day, daily dependent on God for all of our needs, for contentment and trust and, and freedom from anxiety to know that he's going to provide. It, it's, a, it's a prayer for necessities, not for luxuries. I hope you can see that, right? And, and it is a practical prayer, but it is a prayer for more than just physical bread. It is certainly a prayer for physical bread, but our, our physical needs, our needs are more than just bread. It's even spiritual bread that we need every day, isn't it? Deuteronomy 8, God told the people in the wilderness, you shall remember the whole way the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you were going to keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and led you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so we pray for our, our daily provision for all of our needs from God. And next we pray for spiritual forgiveness. Forgiveness. We confess our weakness and sins and failures. 
Another writer says, this is how we must always come to God, not confident of our own righteousness, but pleading his mercy and grace. The Lord's prayer is a sinner's prayer in which we acknowledge that we are unworthy sinners before God, and we need to acknowledge this every day. Just as we ask for daily provision, we, ask, we need to ask for daily pardon. Not, not because we're not forgiven in Jesus Christ, but we need that daily sense of our ongoing need for, for forgiveness to be a reality. And so, and so we're asking for the mercy of God in Jesus Christ that he's already paid and purchased for us to be applied to our hearts every day, freeing us from fear and bondage. And, and when he goes on and says, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us, that doesn't mean that, that our forgiving of others earns God's forgiveness. That goes against everything else we, we see in the Bible. It's rather that God only forgives the penitent, the humble. And one of the chief evidences of humility is a forgiving spirit. John Stott says, once our eyes have been opened to see the enormity of our offense against God, the injuries which others have done to us appear by comparison trifling. If on the other hand, we have an exaggerated view of the offenses of others, it proves that we've minimized our own sins. But when we realize the forgiveness of God, we are freed to forgive others. Our being forgiven and forgiving others always goes hand in hand because you're always going to be a sinner and sinned against. Every day, you're experiencing your own sin and other people's sin. And when you have a sense of God's forgiveness in your own life, what should flow out of you then is a peacemaking spirit and desire toward everyone around you because you are called to love, because you love God, because he has loved you, you're called to love your neighbors. You're called to show his mercy and grace that he's shown to you. And then finally, Jesus tells us we need to pray for protection. And I hope you see your need for protection. As we, as we saw last week, we need to be able to stand against the schemes of the devil to take up the armor of God. And as Paul says in Ephesians 6, you take up the armor of God by praying. It's praying that when temptation comes, God would not leave you, but help you to escape, to stand in the trial. The Lord's Prayer is a sinner's prayer. It's a prayer for grace, trusting the God of all grace. One old hymn writer says, Too vile to venture near thy throne, too poor to turn away. Depending on thy help alone, Lord, teach us how to pray. Too vile to venture near thy throne, too poor to turn away. Depending on thy help alone, Lord, teach us how to pray. One, one more thing I want to point out here that's, that's, again, hidden in our English. We, I want you to notice all of the plurals. And it actually begins at the beginning. Jesus says, when y'all pray, say together, Father, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. Paul Miller says Jesus is showing his disciples how to pray together. We assume the disciples meant teach us to pray individually, but clearly Jesus was responding to the missing request, teach us to pray together. What we call the Lord's Prayer is our prayer for praying together. So are you following Jesus in the school of prayer? 
If, if you see how Jesus prayed in his life and how he needed daily communion with God and guidance from his Father, do you see your need to pray the same? Do your prayers reflect the same emphases that Jesus taught his disciples to pray? Do you pray? Do you want to learn to pray? We're like Martha, so often concerned with so many other things. You think, well, I'll get to pray. I'll get to communion. I'll get to listening to God, seeking God when, I, when I'm done with all of the urgent things that are really unimportant. But what about the big things? Do you put the big rocks in first? Or do the big rocks get crowded out? Have you chosen the better part? Tom mentioned at the beginning of the service that we were asking the church to treat this coming week as a week of emphasis on prayer. Um, we, we have specific questions and need for guidance that we have as a church as we consider the future. And so we're asking that you take some time every day, personally, but in your family, as you meet with other Christians throughout the week, to take some time to pray for our church. And the petitions of the Lord's Prayer are great things to pray for our church. Lord, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your, your kingdom come in our church. Your name be hallowed in our church. Your kingdom come in our community. Show us what you are doing that we want to be part of, that we need to be part of in prayer. Give us our daily bread. Give us what we need. And, and we come to you acknowledging we need your forgiveness. We are not what we should be. We've never been what we should be. We, we need you to help us and we need you to protect us. Protect us from evil. Protect us from uh, the attacks of the enemy. The things that would divide and harm the church of Jesus Christ. Um, and next Sunday evening uh, is going to end with a specific time of focused prayer for the needs of, of the church, for adoration for our God, for who he is, confession of our remaining weaknesses as a people, thanksgiving for what God has done and is doing, and request for his guidance for the future. Um, so have that be a direction to your thoughts this week. And, and most of all, if you're here this morning, and that is completely alien from your life, consider, do you know God as Father? And according to the Bible, the only way to truly know him as Father is through the adoption that comes through Jesus Christ. Let's go to him in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for our Savior Jesus, that he lived the perfect life, that he lived perfect communion with you, dependence on you every day, and even going to the cross when he was bearing our abandonment and our justice was still praying on the cross, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And if he lived that for us, Father, teach us to pray and to live like he did. And we ask in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's close with a word of prayer while the music plays and then we'll have a benediction. Mm -hmm.
fellowship of the fellowship meal begins now as we fellowship with one another while the, the room next door is set up. Please stand for the benediction. Depending on thy help alone, teach us how to pray. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Go in the grace of Jesus Christ.